You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 84 of the Common Descent Podcast. 84. Today, we are talking about a topic called paleopathology. A topic I've been looking forward to. Pathology is the study of, typically, evidence of injury or disease. Yeah. So in modern day, right, forensic pathology and medical pathology, you're talking about injury or disease in the body somewhere, any part of the body, in the organs and the bones, etc. Mm-hmm. Paleopathology, as the name implies, is finding evidence of injury or disease or something gone wrong in fossils. Yes. This episode, we will discuss what paleopathology entails, how we study it, how you recognize evidence of these injuries or diseases, which is called pathologies. So pathology is the study of it and is also what the things themselves are called. Yep. (laughs) Confusingly. And we'll talk about a bunch of cool examples of what this looks like, what we can learn from it, things like that. And even more exciting for this episode, we have a guest. Yeah, we won't be alone. Because it turns out that Will and I have a very good friend who is a paleopathology expert. Thank goodness, because we are not. We are not. Our friend Laura Emmert will be joining us, and she'll get to talk about some of her own personal experiences studying pathologies in the fossil record. And then we're, we're going to learn a bunch of stuff, and it's going to be great. Yeah, all of us. <laughs> this episode was requested by patrons Lydia, Finley, and Kel, and by Jonathan, Mark, and Brian. Good request. So thank you for the request. This is a timely... You know, we didn't plan this, the no. episode about evidence of disease, to coincide with the uh, COVID-19 yeah, pandemic. Yeah, we, we had this scheduled, like, well over like, a month ago. Months ago. Yes. Like, we talked to Laura about this, I think, like, two or three months ago, at least. Yeah. It's just... We, so thank you to uh, SARS-CoV-2 for scheduling around our release of episode 84. (laughs) That was very convenient of you. Before we get into the episode, a few announcements, starting with new patrons. Yeah! We have a Patreon, and if you subscribe at a certain level, we'll thank you by name here on the podcast. This episode, welcome and thank you to Tessa, Kyle, Tim, and La P. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our patrons. Thanks to all of our listeners. We hope that everybody out there is, as we've been saying, keeping safe, keeping healthy, keeping emotionally well in this troubling time that we're in. Mm -hmm. We hope that our podcast episodes are helping people to pass the time and keep learning and stay engaged while you are staying at home or whatever you have to do during this time. And on that line... We've been releasing a lot of bonus content recently. As much extra as we can. Specifically, we've been putting out some new Silver Screen Science episodes. Yeah. We released, by the time this episode is out, we will have released our Silver Screen Science episode about Tremors. Mm Mm-hmm. And one about a 2001 movie that is very dear to my heart (laughs) called Evolution. Both of which are currently on Netflix, at least here in the U.S. Yes. And we watched them with some of our listeners joining us through an app called Netflix Party, which was very fun. We also will have released, by the time this episode comes out, a compilation of mini-episodes recorded for patrons. Yeah, for our higher-level patrons that are specific to their requests. So if you want to hear us do mini-discussions about ancient reptiles and modern salamanders and modern birds and graboids... Again... Go listen to that. (laughs) And we're going to be doing more. So we have a few other things in mind. We have more silver screen science in mind. So keep your ears out for more extra content. We will be filling your podcast feed with extra stuff. Yes. Because it's a good time to be listening to podcasts. And it's a convenient time for us to be producing more content. (laughs) (laughs) Ironically. And with that all out of the way... Let us move on to our next section, the news. The news! 
news. Every episode, we like to start by talking about some recent newses from news regarding fossils and evolution and so on, the kind of things we like to hear about, you like to hear about, keeps everybody up to date. Today, just to mix it up, let's start with Will. All right, all right, all right, I like it. I I, like I've it. thrown a curveball at you. Well, I would like to talk about very, 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 very early hands. Okay. And what I mean by that are some of the earliest hand bones found in fish. I'm on board. This sounds like episode 77 type stuff. It does. <laughs> <laughs> this is research by Richard Cloutier et al. in Nature. And the article is by Flinders University and Fizz.org, the press release. And it covers an ancient fish called Elpistostegi, which is an early tetrapod fish, you know, early cousin, at least, of us vertebrate tetrapod ancestors. Right. So we talked in episode 77 about how one group of fish gave rise to the land vertebrates. Yeah. Collectively called tetrapods. Yes, they were part of that lobe fin fish group. This one was found in Canada. It's from the late Devonian period, about 380 million years ago, and is not small. This fish is about a meter and a half, just over that. So this is actually a sizable fish. That would be about five feet, give or take, and would have been the largest predator in that area of Quebec, they said, during that time. Cool. So yeah, you know, not a bad animal. This group includes multiple members. The Epistostegallians include other similar lobby finned fish like Tiktaalik, the famous Tiktaalik. The from, famous fishapod. Yeah, your inner fish fish. But Tiktaalik, as well as most of these other members, have only ever really been known from incomplete specimens. And that's an issue because it is enough for us to say, yes, these are definitely cousins of early tetrapods, but we don't get a lot of information about how close are they and how tetrapod are they at this point? How limbed have they become? Right. It, it, it means we're missing some of the information on how certain body parts were evolving through this transition. Yeah. Especially because Elpista stegi was, for the most part up to this point, only known from skull pieces. Uh, enough to tell that it's definitely a cousin of these other early tetrapod ancestors, but not quite enough up until this specimen, which is complete and preserves the complete arm pectoral fin, which is the first time in one of these fish. So now we can get a really close look at the arm, and they found some interesting stuff. So through high-energy CT scans... They found that the pectoral fin, so those are the ones on the chest, the front arms, so to speak, had a humerus, which is your upper arm bone, a radius and ulna, which are your two forearm bones, a set of wrist bones, and phalanges organized into digit-like fingers. Basically, an entire arm, which is crazy. That's, that's a lot of arm detail. It's the first time that we've seen fingers locked within a fin and pushes back the origins of digits. So your hand to fish, not early tetrapods. So this is a kind of unveiling really the order of events from fish to land, which is very cool. They think that the increased number of small bones in the fin would have allowed more planes of flexibility to spread out the weight and be able to better support the fish's weight if they push themselves up on those fins. So those phalanges were actually helping them by giving them more structural support. So it could have been helpful for them to either pull themselves out of water or better maneuver in the shallow water, like we talked about in episode 77. There are also features in the upper arm bone, the humerus, that are present in some early amphibians. So they are even finding strong parallels between that. So very cool findings. Now, this does not say that Elpistostegi is our ancestor, but that it is very close to our ancestors, a close cousin at least, and is as close as we currently have to a missing link, quote unquote, between fish and early tetrapods, that 
perfect transitional fossil. So, big deal find. Yeah, this harkens back to one of the things we talked about in episode 77. One of my, I pulled a quote from an article, a paper that I read, that pointed out that the more we learn about this transition from fish to tetrapods, the more we're seeing that the origin of limbs and the origin of tetrapods and the origin of terrestriality are not the same. No. So here is a fish with fins. Pro actual fins. They end in the rays. They are good for swimming. Yep. That have most of a hand inside of them. Yeah, 90% of an arm. <laughs> in terms of bones, which is to suggest that we, that, you know, our evolutionary trajectory, arms as we know them, mostly happened before the animals with them stopped swimming and moved up onto land. If Elpistostegi is not a true tetrapod, then that also suggests that arms were mostly in place before tetrapods. Yeah. If it's still just outside of that, then that fish did a lot of work with arms and hands before tetrapods then inherited it and used it on their journey onto land. Yeah, it's that arms came around before walking was a thing for these creatures and before they could have worn a glove. Like, you wouldn't have seen on the outside any individual digits. No, it was, it was a fin. It was purely internal structure. And so it's interesting to me that we're really learning the other uses for these bones and that they can be useful in ways that we aren't, you know, used to picturing them. They can be useful to a fish, even though they are not using it the way we are. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. As always, we'll link that press release that you said in the blog post. And also, if people are interested, there is a SciShow episode, uh, a SciShow news that mentions that. And I know, because I wrote it. <laughs> it also has a cool study about an ancestral modern bird, which we won't be discussing today. <laughs> well, talking about tetrapods, once those fish gave rise to tetrapods as we know them, tetrapods went on to use those wonderful arms for all sorts of incredible, impressive things. My next news is about snakes. Nice segue. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this research is a new look at some old snakes, a renaming of a snake, and the earliest evidence of heat-sensing organs on a snake face. You have my attention. Oh, just you wait. This is research by Augustin Scanferla and Krister Smith in the journal Diversity, and we'll link to a press release also on phys.org through the Senckenberg Research Institute and Natural History Museum. There is a famous place in Germany called the Messel Pit. Mm -hmm. Early to mid-Eocene aged fossils, around 48 or so million years ago. Extremely well-preserved fossils. This is one of the classic examples of a Lagerstatte, yeah. which are fossil sites that preserve extraordinary detail in fossils. Several snakes have been discovered from this site, four of which are examined in this new study. Three of them are snakes that have been studied before, named Regirix, Ripolophus, and Mesolophus. The fourth one is a species known as Paleopython fisheri. There are many species of Paleopython, one of which is found here in the Messel Pit. This study examines Paleopython fisheri, compares it with other specimens, other species, other snakes, and concludes that it is not Paleopython. <gasps> Scandal. They've reassessed and re-identified this snake. And in doing so, they have constructed a new genus for it named Eoconstrictor fisheri. So this is a weird taxonomic thing. Yep, 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 they yep. are saying that there is a species named Paleopython fisheri. And these authors are saying that is a distinct species. Yes but it doesn't belong in the genus that it was put in. Instead, we have identified it as a different type of snake, and we don't have another genus to put it in, so we have created a new genus name, Eoconstrictor, but the species gets carried over from the original because taxonomy has all these weird rules. Well, it's, you know, there's not really a need to change the second part, the species part of the name, because it still is that species, just in the wrong group. Right, we had to move it to a different part of the tree. Yeah, 
This new genus, Old Species, is known from two complete skeletons. Well, from, from a number of complete skeletons, two of which have gut contents. Whoa! So we know a lot about this snake. They can grow up to two meters or more. Okay. Which is a good... That's the size, uh, the length you should be putting between yourself and other people to stay safe from COVID-19. And when the researchers put the snake's features into a phylogenetic analysis, they found that it plots out as being very closely related to today's boas. Oh. Which also means that it's a convenient change of name from Paleopython to Eoconstrictor, because <laughs> it's not related to pythons, it's related to boas. <laughs> Boids today are neotropical, so it's cool to find one in ancient Germany. Yeah. They mentioned that its skull is a lot like boa constrictor, which is not just a colloquial name of a snake. That is the genus and species name, boa constrictor of a living boa today. They also threw those other three snakes into this analysis, Ragerix, Ripolophus, and Mesolophus, and they also all plotted out as near boas. So Eoconstrictor was very near true boids. The other three are more basal within the boids. And then they did a couple other examinations to see what we can learn about this snake. They found that based on the features of its skeleton, Eoconstrictor looks a lot like modern terrestrial snakes. So statistically, its features plot alongside snakes that spend a lot of time on the ground. So do two of the other snakes. But Mesolophus is long and thin. It has a longer tail. And their analysis wasn't able to place it in a specific habitat preference. But it's clearly different. Which brought them to the conclusion that this was a diverse snake fauna. Ah. Several species with not all the same habitat preference, which is fun to know. They also did a CT analysis of the skulls of these snakes. And in Eoconstrictor, they found evidence in the jaws of these canals, these neurovascular pathways, which is to say channels for nerves and blood vessels to flow, which match what we see in some snakes today specifically the ones that have pit organs on their jaws. And the pits hold these little organs that sense infrared radiation. Heat sensors. Yeah. That's the thermal vision, kind of, that modern boas, pythons, and vipers have. In Eoconstrictor, they found that it has that same morphology, that it most likely had these same sort of pit organs, only in the upper jaw. Whereas modern snakes, you'll see some have upper, some have lower, some have both. And they did not find evidence of pits in the other three snakes. Ooh. Which suggests a few things. First, finding pits just outside of boids, the true boas, suggests that pits evolved very early in their ancestry. It also might indicate that the upper jaw pits evolved first, although we only have one specimen to or one sample to work on so maybe and i didn't know this today they point out pits when it comes to boas and pythons are typically found in larger species that are terrestrial and eat endothermic prey that is to say quote unquote warm-blooded prey which makes sense so the fact that they found the pits in Eoconstrictor, but no evidence in the three smaller species, suggests that that is a trend that continued, that that was in place back then. And the fact that Eoconstrictor appears to have been a terrestrial snake, as opposed to arboreal or aqua- semi-aquatic or yeah. something, or burrowing, suggests that that also holds true. But its prey is less certain. It has been suggested in the past that the reason pits evolved was for detecting warm-bodied animals, either for hunting them, right, if you're going after rodents or something, or for avoiding them. But there is no evidence of, quote, warm-blooded predators in this assemblage, and we have two examples of prey of Eoconstrictor because of those two specimens that have gut contents, one of which is a lizard, Mm-hmm. which is the specimen that had a lizard in it that had a bug in it. Oh, yeah. It's one of the three-in-one specimens. And the other one is a small crocodilian. Oh. 
Yeah, no, it the, the, it was a good time back in the <laughs> early Nydia scene. Everything was right with the world. <laughs> Neither of which are homeothermic. No. They are not warm-blooded, warm-bodied animals. So this, the authors point out, seems to suggest, assuming that is typical of the prey of the species, that it was not using its heat pits to go after mammals and birds and, and traditionally warm-bodied prey. So altogether, we have a vision of an early boid, a vision of an early snake fauna, an assemblage of snakes, and a sense that some of the patterns we see in snakes today held true 50 million years ago in these ancient boas. Very cool. It's a very cool detailed study. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting because of how many things are implicated and suggested by it. Uh, you know, some of which are very cool, like the heat going with bigger snakes or heat, you know, sensing going with bigger snakes. Uh, but the prey parts particularly intriguing that it doesn't seem like they're hunting what we would have expected. Right. Which to me makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because they also, I read the paper and they pointed out in the paper that modern day heat pits in snakes are able to sense like fractions of a degree of difference in heat, which, and I am not an expert in studying pitted snakes or mm -hmm. ancient snake ecology, Eocene snake ecology at least, mm -hmm. but it seems like heat pits would also be good at tracking lizards and crocodilians yeah. and stuff because they're still going to be thermally different from their environment if they're being active and if they're basking and if they're absorbing heat. Well, and because that's something that people often misunderstand about heat sensitive stuff like a thermal camera doesn't just see hot stuff it sees temperature differences right you're still if you know if a lizard basks in the sun for a while yeah and gets its blood pumping it's gonna be warmer than it's you know then it runs into the the leaf litter mm -hmm. it's gonna be warmer than the leaf litter and so you're still getting it's all about degrees of differences uh between the hot and the cool things so yeah, it makes sense that they could still be catching those things. But then also, we only have two data points right. on what they were eating. So we don't know that they weren't also catching anything that might have been more often warmer. We need, as as always, we need more specimens. Yes. More ex excellently preserved snakes are always good. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Well, you know what I always think of when I think of snakes? What? Australia. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And you know what I think of when I think of Australia right now? What? Very early animal life. Okay. That's what the next news is about. Nice segue. Yeah, thanks. I learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> this bit of news is about what appears to be potentially one of the earliest animal ancestors ever. Okay. So, yeah, lots of... Lots of Potentially new cool info. Big claim. Let's see if it holds up, listeners. This is research by Scott Evans et al. in the Proceedings of Natural Academy of Sciences. And the article is by the University of California in phys.org. So that press release. They're getting a lot of press this time. Yeah, they are. <laughs> this is a fossil from Australia dating back to that early Ediacaran biota. Ooh, episode 31. Yeah, so we're going before the Cambrian. When there's lots of things scuttling around in the sand and muck deep down in the water, but none of them, for the most part, at least until more recent times, have seemed to be directly identifiable as animals or even plants or fungi or anything we could definitely recognize. So they've been kind of a mystery, but they've been a very interesting biota to look into for what early life might have looked like and what early animals may have looked like because then we get that cambrian explosion where everything seems to pop in at once so the ediacaran has been that that very likely source of those early ancestors well this team has found what they think may be the earliest bilaterian which is the group of life that have a front end and a back end and are symmetrical you know the two sides going down that length are identical 
you know, left and right, and has an opening at the front and the back connected by a gut. Right. A mouth and a not mouth. Yes. Us and most animals. Yeah. Think of an animal, it's probably bilateral. Yeah. Bilateral symmetry. That's what this group is defined by. And this is important for a couple reasons. One, if it is a bilaterian, that means it is very likely related to our, you know, most animals' ancestors, which is a big deal for understanding our evolution. It's also important because it suggests different modes of life, that this is, that this body symmetry is often associated with, like, being able to move purposefully, uh, which is not 100% because things like sea stars get around fine and they move very purposefully, you know, as purposefully as you can without a brain. Now, for the longest time, there were predictions for what this earliest bilaterian would look like and that it would be simple and small and that it would date to around this time, but we didn't have any fossils of it. We didn't have any evidence or had not found any that we recognized, but we had burrows. The Ediacaran is full of burrows in the sediment, which many scientists had suspected were made by early ancestors of bilaterians, but we didn't have the creatures who made the burrows until this team noticed very small, as they say, minuscule impressions, oval impressions, like if you press the fingertip into something, you know, like a, a fingerprint near some of these burrows. Consistently, they notice these impressions. So with funding from the NASA Exobiology Grant. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> they used three-dimensional laser scanners. Also cool. To map these impressions. What they found was a regular consistent shape of a cylindrical body with a distinct head and tail with faintly grooved, like, segments, musculature. Ooh. Seems very bilaterian. Like a worm kind of like thing. Like a very small, ovally worm hmm. thing. This is little bulb. Graboids. So, they named a new species. Like you do. They did not name them graboids, though. Well, throw the whole thing out. Yep, yep. You had your chance and you missed it. <laughs> no. They named this Ikaria Wariutia which is a 550 million year old Ediacaran species that seems to be a tiny worm-like potential ancestor to bilaterians. Very cool find. Yeah, it's it's a big deal, big suggestion. Now these are itty bitty. Oh yeah. We are talking between 2 to 7 millimeters long and between 1 to 2 and a half millimeters wide. The largest is about the size of a grain of rice. Whew. Just the right size, though, to be making the burrows that they've been finding. Okay. So it does seem like they are at least potentially connected. They're near each other. They're the right size. And the burrows preserve a cross-section V-shaped ridge in their structure that suggests if they were making these burrows, they were doing it through a peristaltic locomotion like a worm that stretching and scrunching motion that could fit that musculature they were seeing so it, it seems like a good fit and if this is all true the burrows that these impressions are associated with are found lower than any others which means it would be the oldest fossil of this level of complexity or this type of body structure so it would very likely be our oldest currently known bilaterian ancestor so far. That's very cool, not just because it's a potential ancestor or cousin of animals as we know them, which is a very fascinating thing to see, but also for the suggestion that we found the trace maker of a trace. Yes. Which, as we've talked before when we discuss ichnology and, and traces and footprints and stuff, you rarely get to find out exactly what creature made your footprints or burrows yeah so potentially finding the two together not only tells us about the structure of this early animal possibly but also its behavior and the way it was digging through the sediment mm -hmm. you know we've talked about how the ediacaran into the cambrian saw this 
revolution in the sediment Mm -hmm. in how much the sediment was being used and how we start to see animals digging down into the sediment and stratifying their ecosystem that this may be one of the earliest creatures that was part of that habitat ecological shift and it sounded like there were even potential feeding traces within the burrows that suggest it was feeding as it dug on probably just leftover detritus very cool yeah that's a really cool find way to go australian folks i love australia (laughs) all right what segue do you have for us now well if that is one of the earliest ancestors of bilaterian animals as we know them uh dinosaurs all right yeah i mean they're got a left and a right so this next research is about a new species of dinosaur from new mexico a dromaeosaur so the the group of dinosaurs that ever since 1993 most people will recognize if you call them raptors yes this research caught my eye because of the people who published it uh first author on this new study is steve jasinski hey a friend of ours we know steve hey steve it's steve and it's bob sullivan who offered a bunch of guidance for me during my graduate thesis. Mm -hmm. And it's Pete Dodson, very well-known vertebrate paleontologist who I've spoken to. I don't know him very well. And every time I see him, I want to say, Dodson, we've got Dodson here. I I, was resisting. And I don't do it because I assume that I am the hundredth person who wants to do that. And so I've (laughs) never done it. I resist every time. So Steve et al. published this in the journal Scientific Reports. And we'll link to an article, an article, a journalistic article, by Brian Hanwork in Smithsonian Magazine. Dromaeosaurids are a group of theropod dinosaurs, so bipedal, carnivorous. This is the group that includes Velociraptor and Deinonychus and Utahraptor. They are well known for being feathery, for having long, grasping hands, for having stiff tails and those sickle claws on their feet. Yeah, that big killer inner toe. Most dromaeosaurs are in the fox to coyote size range. Yeah, I mean, they're they're dog-sized for most of them. Some get up to wolf-sized or even bigger. Yeah, there's a couple of monsters. They are well-known around the world, but in the very latest Cretaceous of North America, toward the very end of the Mesozoic, they are rare. There are only two known confidently, Dakota raptor and Akero raptor, both in the Hell Creek fauna. Here, the researchers have identified a new one. (gasps) This one comes from the Maastrichtian, so latest Cretaceous, of New Mexico, and they have named it Deneobolator notohesperus. It is, according to them, the first identifiable dromaeosaur, nameable diagnostic dromaeosaur, from the latest Cretaceous of the southern U.S. It's the third known from this time period in North America, along with those other two. Over the course of several field seasons, over the last decade and a half or so, the researchers collected 20 fossil elements that together constitute a partial skeleton of this animal, including parts of the skull, the vertebrae, and the front and back limbs. Cool! It's not a lot of the specimen, it's very fragmentary but enough to reconstruct an image of an animal about the size of Velociraptor. So coyote-sized, turkey-sized kind of animal. They also found on the preserved parts of the front limb of Deneobolator that it had quill knobs. Ah, <gasps> cool. Which are the little bumps where arm feathers attached. So they suggest that it had 12 to 14 long feathers on its arms like we also see in Velociraptor and some other dromaeosaurs. So this was a feathery, small dromaeosaur. And when they phylogenetically examined it to place it amongst the rest of the dinosaurs, they found that it groups with a family called the Velociraptorinae. Ah. So it is, in fact, a close relative of Velociraptor. Velociraptor, of course, is Asian. Yes. More on that in a second. The name Deneobolator comes from Dene, which is the Navajo word for the Navajo people, and Belater means warrior. Cool name. So it's a Navajo warrior dromaeosaur. Cool. Which is pretty cool. And closer examination of some of the preserved pieces led them to make some inferences about its mobility, 
and its musculature and its movement capabilities, they found that there are features on the four limbs, particularly around the hands, that suggest large musculature, so that it may have had a very strong grip, stronger than we see in other dromaeosaurs, and features near the base of the tail suggest the tail was highly mobile, instead of maybe being as stiff as we see in some other dinosaurs, and that mobility may have been used for agile running around after prey. Mm -hmm. So if you think of, they, they, they compared it to a cheetah, that when cheetahs are running as they're turning directions, the tail is whipping back and forth to help maintain that momentum. Yeah, watching those chases in slow motion, you can see it just rotate the tail, you know, 180 back and forth as it's changing direction. However, these inferences are being made from very small pieces of skeleton. Mm -hmm. So, intriguing if true, but we'll have to see if more comes up in the future. They also noticed, fitting for this episode, that it had two injuries, <gasps> pathologies, one, a rib that was broken and healed, and the other, a gouge mark in one of the hand bones Ooh. that appears to fit roughly the, the the size and shape of a claw of a similarly sized animal. Ooh. So that this could have been a confrontational injury. This one was not healed, which suggests, as you'll hear later in the episode, that this injury happened at or shortly before the death of the animal. Yeah. It didn't have time to heal from it. But in the broader sense of things, this discovery has implications for the evolution of dromaeosaurs through the end of the Cretaceous. Earlier velociraptorine dromaeosaurs are over in Asia, including Velociraptor itself. The fact that we have Deneobolator and I think Acheroraptor is the other one in North America that is in the same group, both over here, in the even later Cretaceous, suggests that this group dispersed over to North America and then diversified a bit. Yeah. The fact that we have three different types of dromaeosaurs from the very latest Cretaceous from at least two major groups within dromaeosaurs suggests that this group, like a lot of dinosaur groups, you know, that they were still speciating, they were still diversifying, they were still maintaining a diversity even up to the very end of the Cretaceous. Yeah. That even in the last few million years before the end Cretaceous extinction, episode five, you had different populations in the north and south of North America. You had multiple family groups. You had several species. These were a diverse group of dinosaurs right up to the end. Yeah. They, they weren't petering out anyway. They were doing well. And the diverse part's the cool part to me because like... If, if the observations hold up with future specimens of, like, strong grip and more mobile tail, that means there, there could have been lots of unique behaviors you're seeing between these individual species, which is cool. And I think that's something that's easy to forget when you think about a group of dinosaurs like the dromaeosaurs, is that, yeah, they're all small running around predators. Oh, yeah, but... You know, that's like saying all cats right. are the same. And it's like a bobcat is very different from a leopard. And this could have been a hunting in a very unusual way. You know, maybe it was pouncing, you know, or chasing uniquely. And that's that's cool. I like that. Yeah, I, I like the image. I always relate dromaeosaurs to cats. Yeah. That's my comparison that I like to make. It's a pretty good comparison. And yeah, today we've got pumas and bobcats here and, and tons of you know released domesticates. Yeah, here in the U.S. doing different things, and I, I like to imagine a diverse fauna of these little raptor dinosaurs around the U.S. Yeah, right up to the end. I just pictured if anyone's ever seen a video of a bobcat going after a bird, where they just like launch themselves seven or eight feet into the air, and then do this the, those crazy backflips to try to grab the bird, and then also land right side up. Mm -hmm. uh, I could totally picture a dromaeosaur doing that and then using its tail to rotate yes. itself while it reaches out and grabs with a powerful grip. So, like, cool stuff. You yeah. You're doing really neat things. There was a video by, I can't remember the name of the YouTube channel off the top of my head right now, but it the, the guy, who I also can't remember his name, took a video of cats falling yeah. and showing in slow motion how they rotate in the yeah. air. 
And you can see that tail is doing a lot of work in making that motion of the body happen. Really cool. So congrats to Steve. Yeah, On well his done. new little dinosaur. And without further ado, I think we can move on from the news to our main episode discussion. So here after the break, we will be joined by our friend Laura, who will talk to us a bunch about injuries and disease and how we study them in the fossil record. It'll be a joy. It's going to be great. Stay tuned. Hi, Laura. Hi, guys. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Before we get into our topic of discussion, would you mind to just introduce yourself to our listeners? Okay, well, um, I'm Laura Emmert. I'm a field worker and preparator at the Gray Fossil Site, so that's where I have met these guys originally, way mm-hmm. back when. Um, and I spend my time digging the fields in the summer, excavating our fossils, and in the winter, come inside and prep the fossils that we've excavated, as well as doing uh, modern prep for the zoology collection over the winter as well. So processing the, the modern skeletons. Cool. Yeah, you were one of our fellow grad students when we were in the master's program at yes. ETSU, and now one of our co-workers at the Gray Fossil Site, one of the, one of the few co-workers who's been on the podcast. Hey, look at me. Yeah, in, in rare company. <laughs> and fun fact for our listeners... Laura has done research on a bunch of cool stuff, including pathological things that we're going to talk about, but also was one of the authors that named the Gray Fossil Site Rhino, yeah. which is pretty cool. Which is really cool. <laughs> I, th- I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. <laughs> now, that's awesome, but this is not an episode about rhinos. It is an... I know. I, well, someday. It, listeners, request yeah, if right. you want. This is an episode about paleopathology. So if you would, Laura, please start by explaining what does pathology mean and then what does it mean in the context of fossils? Okay, so pathology is just the study of disease and injuries and the mechanisms that can cause such things. And you, there's lots of differences between paleopathology and modern pathology. So modern pathology, I actually have my whole list of all the modern pathologies that are here and I won't go into detail, but <laughs> you have anatomical pathology, cytopathology, histopathology, neuropathology, pulmonary pathology, (laughs) renal pathology, surgical pathology, and forensic pathology, which is what I would have done if I had not ended up in paleontology as forensic pathology, because it's amazing. Um, (laughs) Sounds cool. But with modern pathology, you have so much technology at your disposal. Um, You have extensive microscopy, you have the whole medical field behind you, um, and there's a lot more funding for it. With paleopathology, you're limited to looking at the bone. Um, (laughs) There are, it's surprising how little the field of paleopathology has developed over the years, since the first record of it was in the 1700s, like 1794, in fact, was the oldest recorded instance of paleopathology. And even as late as 2017, we're still only using things like x-rays, CTs, and DNA analysis. That's about as advanced as it gets. Huh. So you're looking for signs of disease and injury, as you said. And now a pathology, if I understand correctly, can happen in any sort of... You can get it in the skin and organs like that list that you listed. Yeah, each each section or system of the body. Yes. Right. Plants can have pathologies, I assume. You can get pathologies in shells of Mm -hmm. things. But this episode, like most of our episodes, is going to be rather vertebrate biased. That's not to say that I don't have examples of plants and invertebrates, but yeah, vertebrate heavy. (laughs) So in vertebrates, we're looking at bones. Cool. In In vertebrates. In in the group vertebrates. Space vertebrates. (laughs) (laughs) So can we get into a little more detail on how do you get a pathology? Like what, what makes pathologies happen? So bone is, it's got a very strict remodeling protocol, and very little things can disturb it. Uh, hormone imbalances, uh, particularly the big one is an imbalance of calcium and phosphorus in your blood. And any little thing that messes up these remodeling protocols can have a pretty noticeable effect on the bone structure. So you have your osteoblasts, which build bone, 
and your osteoclasts, which take away bone. And what you can have is you can have bacteria, viruses, etc., that can cause things like apoptosis, and um, which is cell death in in the osteoblasts, the ones that are forming bone. Um, necrosis of the bone of the cells. So a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like taking necrotic damage. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you can even cause the osteoblasts to eat themselves. It's called autophagy. Ooh. It's very weird. They, it's not, it's not good. Uh, but anything that can affect the osteoblasts or osteoclasts will mess up your bones. Um, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's your, your builders and your breaker downs. If you mess with them and one, it gets out of balance. Exactly. All right. Yeah. And there's, uh, I think it's called Paget's disease. That's all it is, is, uh, the osteoclasts are, in underdrive, basically, and the osteoblasts are in hyperdrive, and so your bone ends up building on one side and taking away on the other, and it'll cause your whole bone to bend out to the side. It's oh, weird. Really weird. Wow, like a meandering river. Yeah. But a yeah. bone. Yeah. Wow. It's not great. No, that sounds terrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, of all the ways to get a, a bend in a bone, I wouldn't have thought of that one. Mm-hmm. For it to be growing in the wrong direction. Yeah. That's weird. Interesting. So a pathology is not... I guess in my head when I think of a pathology, the obvious examples are like a bone breaks Mm -hmm. and you can look at the bone and it is broken. Or, you know, bacteria has like dug out a a hole or something in there. Yes. But I've not really ever thought about the mechanism Mm -hmm. that what you've done is you have caused the bone to work wrong. It's incredibly complicated. Um, Even I'm not up to speed. I haven't boned up on all the <laughs> chemical pathways. Um, but it's it's incredibly complex when you get a bacteria in there. The way the cells of your bones will react to it is there's so many different mechanisms. There's something like five or six different mechanisms just for osteoporosis. Well, it, it, it seems like you could probably have similar outcomes from very different scenarios yes like you know it's like uh symptoms like what does a runny nose indicate that's something in your nose is unhappy like that's a huge problem in pathology is bone can only react in certain ways so one of the issues that you have is is it a tumor or is it a broken bone if it's a highly remodeled broken bone you might think it's a weird tumor you might think it's just a growth um and infections from all kinds of different bacteria will only really react in a certain way. They're like, well, that sure is an infection. (laughs) That's as precise as we can get. Where with modern pathology, you can take the person and you can do DNA and you can do a biopsy and you can excise it and you can look at it under a scope and you can do all this, that, and the other. With a fossil, it's like, well, we can micro CT that and that's about as detailed as you're going to get. Yeah, no, I mean, it's your, the crime is long, long dead. Yes. <laughs> like, it's happened a long time ago. That's not to say that DNA isn't used. And I've got a really cool example that I'll talk about a little bit later. Cool. Yeah, it's great. I guess, uh, on the one hand, there's, you know, those issues with studying fossil pathology. And we'll get into more examples of how we do it and what makes it difficult later. But on the other hand, I would imagine that it's something that is shared by pretty much anything with bones. Mm-hmm. So hopefully that kind of balances out, like, because from at least my limited experience with it, if you have enough of a sample of a fossil organism of, or of a species, you should find pathologies. Yes, you absolutely should. And they are rare, but the good thing is, is like when you find something like a broken bone. It's going to be the same if it's a temnospondyl or a snake or a bird. A break is a break because it's all bone. Human bone, dinosaur bone, they're going to react the same way, which is cool. Yeah, that's it's a rare example of something that transcends the taxes that mm-hmm. you know, it you're dealing with the same mechanics regardless of group. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah. It's one. It's a thing that ties us all together. It's <laughs> our ability to go wrong. Yeah, everyone gets hurt. <laughs> yep. And I assume is it would it be fair to say if you know you know we don't, we don't have to go into detail that pathology in things like plants or in wood or in you know exoskeleton of invertebrates and stuff is it a similar idea that you, your growth and ungrowth has basically gone out of whack? Very similar. So with plants, you'll see things like 
discoloration of the leaves, you'll see uh, mechanical damage from insects, and you'll see a kind of a ring around the insect damage of where the plant has basically necrotized. Um, and you'll see wilting and crinkling and deformed growth, very similar to you would see in plants today, because a leaf is a leaf is a leaf. Yeah. <laughs> and they respond to viruses and nematodes and bacteria in the same way. So it's all, in most aspects of paleontology, it's comparing what you see in the fossil record to what is going on today, which is pretty cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. The same thing with invertebrates. So we have all of this information on how shrimps and crabs and lobsters and whatever else form, like rebuild themselves after injuries. They'll molt and regrow a leg or something like that. You see the same thing in trilobites and ancient arthropods because the healing mechanism is pretty much the same. Yeah, and actually, cool. we talked about trilobites in episode 82, yes. and I remember, I don't actually remember if I said this in the episode, I think I did, that because trilobites were molting their exoskeleton, and then, you know, as they went through their life stages, each molt holds the evidence of whatever, if they had an injury, whatever stage of healing that injury was at mm -hmm. during that molt, so we see that. Yes, in the molts, which is very cool. It is cool. There is actually, uh, I'll just jump ahead and give a little fun fact here. Go for it. <laughs> there is a trilobite species, Telfina intermedia, um, and it actually had this horrible eye injury. And I don't know if that's one that you've mentioned specifically on the last note. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, oh, it's so cool. So <laughs> its eye had this extensive damage, and it was a molt. So obviously the animal had survived at least one molt. Um, with this injury, and it seemed like the eye, what they hypothesized is that it had been bitten by a cephalopod. So, Ooh. like, a bellum knight or, you know, whatever kind of cephalopod it was, bit it in the eye and it managed to escape and then molted through it. And it's actually based on the kind of smooth, flat area that had formed underneath it. It's actually, they're calling it one of the world's first examples of a clotting mechanism. A wow. way for the body to protect itself from just bleeding out. Oh. Yeah, so we're talking... Ordovician. Ordovician, that's, yeah. Uh, so yeah. That is really neat. So pathology, in, in, including paleopathology, particularly with bones and exoskeletons and stuff, is everything from being bitten by something to being infected by something to being infested Yes, I do, I do talk Bust. a little bit about parasitism. Just, just a little. Excellent. Well, we can... I feel like we have a good sense of what it is. I'm curious to know how we research it. And when I say we, as usual, our listeners are, I think, accustomed to me saying this now. I don't mean me. Nope. And I don't mean Will. Nope. But I do mean Laura. <laughs> how do you study and identify pathologies in the fossil record? So... To identify them, well, really, whenever... Like, I did a project working on the pathologies of the tapers at the Gray Fossil Site. And what I spent my day doing was opening drawers and looking at bones and looking at every single one of them to see if I saw anything slightly different. Yeah, just weird. Just anything that did not look right. And I'm like, all right, awesome, got it, pathology. Check, make a list. I did the same thing in the Florida collection, the Florida Museum of Natural History, opening drawers and looking for anything weird and that's pretty much how things have gone for most people they you know they're excavating and they find a bone and it's cracked in half and healed and like oh well that's neat and send it in and probably ignore it for a year or so and <laughs> <laughs> then get back to it um but there are different methods of studying different pathologies so typically the, the fancy term, the $10 word for it, is uh, macromorphological examination. That is oh, a very fancy term. <laughs> just means looking at it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, but you can actually, you could do some more advanced techniques. So one of my favorite examples of this, because it encompasses like almost all of the methods, is this example. So I think this was Rothschild? This might not have been. Either way, if you hear the name Rothschild... Uh, Bruce Rothschild is probably the leading paleopathologist. If you want to get into paleopathology, you look him up. He's done all of it. I know I've seen the name. Yeah. yeah. I think I've met him. Yeah, I've met him at SVP. He's really nice. Yeah. Um, but they found the oldest record of tuberculosis in a bison. Now, this is not the oldest record of tuberculosis ever, um, but it is the oldest in bison. And so it's 17,000 years old. And it's from Natural Trap Cave in Wyoming. Cool. You're familiar with Natural Trap? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so what they noticed was they're looking at, they looked at the bone. They did their macro morphological <laughs> examination. And they said, huh, that's real weird. So tuberculosis, when it's infecting, because it's a uh, it's bacteria. I don't have the scientific name for it. It's yeah, a bacteria. Yeah, uh, when it infects the bone, it does have a pretty classic response. It'll form pits in the vertebrae. It forms these exostoses, which are just excess bone growths on the vertebrae. And it'll form curvatures in human spines, but that wasn't the case in this bison. It was recognized by the pitting and the exostoses. And they said, gosh, this looks like tuberculosis. And so then they x-rayed it. They did radiological analysis. And they actually found that the bone had been thinning in the areas where they were suspecting it was TB. And they're like, oh, okay, so we did the x-ray. We did the macromorphological examination. Now let's sample the DNA to see if there's tuberculosis DNA inside it. And there was... <laughs> That's really it's cool. So cool. <laughs> so you can also use uh, micro CTs, regular CTs. So they didn't use the CT scans on this one, but they did the X-rays. That's really about it for the methodology. There's just not a lot out there. So as Rothschild says, he said this in a poster at SVP once, was that experience plus a good diagnosis is about all you can really hope for. You have to kind of know what you're looking at. Yeah. already you have to have a good yeah. sense of the medical side of things and i as you were explaining it i was thinking that it, it seems like a lot of recognizing pathology is also recognizing what bone is supposed to look like yes mm -hmm. so like you know if, if you pick up a femur in order to recognize that it is a weird femur you need to know what a femur is supposed to look like in the first place exactly no it's like if you the <laughs> the first time you ever get to hold a bird bone and I didn't know what bird bones were like. I'd be like, oh, this is a sick animal. <laughs> this, this animal has no marrow. It is dying. Yeah, it's needing to know what the norm is to recognize what, what an oddity is. Right. Now, that being said, pathological bones will more often than not jump out at you. <laughs> they have this super spongy, like with, with an infection specifically, they get this super frothy texture. And that really is the best. Like, there's no $10 word for frothy. It's spongy, <laughs> yeah. it's gross. And that actually, this is a part that I meant to explain earlier, is the process of healing a, a break. So when you break your bone, like you fall out of a tree, you break your bone, the first thing that forms is the hematoma. So you get this bruise. And what the bruising does right there is it actually kind of sends out an alert signal to the osteoblasts, the cells that build bone. And they say, guys, something is really wrong. <laughs> Come here. And so all the osteoblasts are like, oh, guys, come on, let's go. And they all hold hands and they run over to the break. And then what you'll hap what happens is once the osteoblasts are there, they'll actually form cartilage out of the hematoma. So they take the blood and they turn it into this cartilaginous support system. Oh. And they call that the soft callus. Wow, I think we saw that in Cells at Work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or something very much like it. Yeah, it was, it's similar to when they were building the clot. And yeah, they, yeah. Was, oh, yeah, I so, didn't know that. Blood tissue basically converted into cartilaginous tissue? Basically. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's weird. That is really weird. Yeah. And so the osteoblasts keep working, they keep doing their thing, and gradually they will convert, and again, this is all very complicated chemical pathways, blah, blah, blah. So then they basically turn the cartilage into spongy bone, mm -hmm. which is why when you see a recently healed break, it's frothy and lumpy and bumpy and gross and it looks uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's because you basically have cancellous bone on the outside, which is not where it's supposed to be. Right. So normally, if you think of the structure of a bone, it's the solid outer wall of the bone, which is your cortical bone. And then on the interior is, like you keep saying, spongy, which is what it looks like right. and what a lot of people will call it, this very porous bone that has space for bone marrow and blood vessels and all that sort of stuff. But on the inside where it belongs... Right. Behind a, a solid wall shield. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from all the gross stuff happening outside the bone. <laughs> that makes that makes much more sense as to why broken bones look the way they do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and you are right. Like I I've seen pathological bones before, and they they look wrong. Yeah. They they look. It's kind of like how when you can say something looks sick or infected, mm -hmm. people often just know what you mean. It's, it it looks like it's not good. We just have a. It looks like that. Right. Looks looks not good. Yep. 
And I'm glad you explained that because I was about to bring up every now and then I'll get a question from, you know, somebody at a museum or, or something who will say, if you see a weird bone, how do you know that it's a new species versus a weird injured or mutated? You know, how do you know if it's a pathology or if it's just a kind of taper you've never seen before? And I think that's a, a big part of the answer is you can usually tell bone gone wrong from bone the way that bone, you know, uh, business as usual. Mm -hmm. Right. You absolutely can. Now, there are some cases where you have an injury on one side of the body and you would see compensation on the other side of the body that might mm -hmm. alter the morphology. And my favorite example of this is a dog burial. Uh, somewhere in Europe. Czech Republic, Turkey, Spain, one of those. And there had been this dog with this horrific shoulder injury. And, you know, it had some kind of blunt force blow to its shoulder and it crippled it. And so it was hobbling on three legs for the rest of its life. And what they found was uh, extreme muscle attachments and kind of stress response in the remaining bones. And they found arthritis more in like the compensating hind limb than the other. And so if you only found the non-injured side, you might think, oh, well, you know, this animal had unusual muscle growth and maybe it was, you know, if that was the only one you had, you might have reconstructed it as this beefy animal. Yeah, it's a dire it, dog. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when maybe it had an injury on the other side that you're just not aware of. So there's always something to play with. But generally speaking, you know, nine times out of ten, when you see a pathology, you're like, ugh, ugh, ugh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm uncomfortable now yeah. looking yeah. at it. <laughs> That makes so much... I didn't even think about compensation effects. That's really, have, really my, interesting. My favorite story about compensating bone is someone had messaged me online years and years ago saying, hey, I need some help identifying the skull. This is my favorite game. Let's play. <laughs> and she sends me this photo of this animal, and it looks like a raccoon, but it has the largest sagittal crest that I've ever seen. So that's the ridge and the top of the skull that holds on to jaw muscles. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen anything like it, not even in, like, the oldest badgers in the world. <laughs> I was like, this is just wild. And something else was wrong with the skull, and I couldn't put my finger on it right away. And then I realized it had had all of its canine teeth removed. Turns out this was a movie animal, and so they'd taken out its canine teeth so that it couldn't bite people on set. And to compensate with its back teeth, it had grown this incredible sagittal crest because it was using its jaw muscles so much more than it would have otherwise. Wow. That's so weird. Wow. They removed the teeth so it couldn't bite and it got better at biting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you if you remove my canines, I shall become more powerful <laughs> than you could possibly imagine. That's, it's also, I, I think, very easy to, at least for me, be surprised at how much stuff like that can affect the bones. Like an injury makes sense. That is an external alien force coming in and messing up your anatomy but like me walking funny or me chewing weird that that also will translate to the bone that people millions of years you know later could find is our bones are a lot more plastic than one might expect they are um even people's jobs today will have an effect on their skeletons so in forensic pathology you can make assumptions that if somebody has developed highly developed muscles uh, with the muscles that are used to like hold up a tray at a restaurant, <laughs> they'll actually develop excess muscle gro or excess bone growth to compensate for the muscles. And you can be like, oh, based on this humerus, this person might have been in food service. And you can narrow <laughs> down things like that. Or a oh, spear but... thrower. I am, you know, I am yeah. sure that we have listeners right now looking at their arms and like... Yeah. <laughs> like Will's doing. Yeah, figuring <laughs> out like, do I? What I, do I do? I have excess bone growth that supports the muscles that allow me to sit. <laughs> I was, no, it's going to be your typing. Yeah, my typing. Yeah, <laughs> That's my, what it is. My hands. You know. My thumbs. My thumbs are really... For joysticks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, this we, we've already started talking about this question of when it gets tricky to identify pathology. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, I want to sort of move us in that direction of what are the ways, besides what we've talked already, I imagine that you know, pathology is not always a one-to-one. -one. You see a thing, you know exactly what it was. What makes it hard to study pathologies? So it's hard. So one of the things that we always have to play this little game with is, is it truly a pathology 
Is it a injury? Is it an injury or a disease? Or is it a genetic defect? If a certain population of a certain percentage of the population has it, is it still a pathology or is it just a character? Oh, okay. So yeah. there are examples. Uh, there was a study put out fairly recently. Uh, oh, my gosh. I say recently. Probably 2009. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's recent. Um, and this uh, student was looking at arthritis in rhinoceroses and through their evolutionary history, starting out with, I think, as far back as like Hyracotherium and all the way down into modern rhinos. And she found that over time there became nearly 100% occurrence of arthritis in rhinoceroses and kind of excess bone growth on all of the toe bones, basically. So, you know, rhinoceroses have all this weight and they're compressing their toe bones down. And she called it the s'mores effect, where you <laughs> squish it and the bone squishes out. And she was calling this a pathology and she's calling it arthritis and she's calling it this and that and the other. I'm like, but, but if 100% of the rhinos have it, yeah. is it still a pathology? And so there's a fine line there. Um, and her science was good, and it's just me being stubborn. No, no, I mean, it's, it's uh, like, would you call hearing degradation in humans with age a pathology? If Even though, like, almost everyone experiences some amount of hearing loss as we get older, is that a pathology or is that just age? You know, is that just something that animal does? Right. Well, another good example of this that was just published fairly recently, probably 2016, 2017, like, very recently... Um, was uh, Paranthropus robustus, the, the big uh, ancient hominid with the big teeth. Yes, yes, yes. A really cool thing about this one is that nearly 50% of the baby teeth that it had and something like 14 or 15% of its adult teeth had this condition called am amylogenesis imperfecta, which is excessive pitting on their teeth. And I was like, all right, well, if half the population has it, it must be genetic somehow as you tied to the genetic genetics so i say 50 percent of all the the baby teeth and 15 percent of the permanent teeth in this one species that is compared to six and five percent in all other hominids combined wow. this species is riddled with this condition and the thought is that the their selection for super thick enamel and large teeth somehow caused a weird gene flexibility so having your excessive enamel made them prone to having pits so is that a tech is that a pathology or is it just a character that that species now has yeah it's very right, weird. right well i imagine you could also end up with a situation where a pathology is common because of the behavior of mm -hmm. your end so like you talked about the you know this the, the person carrying the tray of food mm -hmm. if your whole population is carrying trays of food then every member is going to have that weird extra growth in the arm. Exactly. So you could end up with something that is technically pathological because it's being affected by outside influences, but every member has it because they're all doing the same sort of behavior. Well, I'm so glad that you brought that up because <laughs> I have a perfect example. Oh, please tell us. So sauropods are known to have fusion in their tail vertebrae. Right, the big, long neck, long tail dinosaurs. Exactly. Uh, they're known to have fusion in, in their caudal vertebrae, their tail vertebrae, up near the pelvis. And it, what's basically happening is it's not that the vertebrae, like the actual, the centrum, the, the round part of the vertebrae is fusing together. It's that the ligaments that are holding the vertebrae together are turning into bone. They're ossifying. Oh. Yeah, super weird, right? And this happens in about 50% of several species. I think Camarasaurus, Apatosaurus, and Diplodocus, I think were the three that were mentioned. And so if 50% of them have it, the thought is that it's related to sexual dimorphism. Mm. Either all of the males are doing it or all the females are doing it. So with males, it's hypothesized that if it is the males that are doing this, it's um, related to that whip cracking that they do with their tails. Yeah, It provides that base that allows them to crack the ends of their tails. Or if it's females that are doing it, the hypothesis is that it is allowing the females to lift their tails up and out of the way for mating. Okay, yeah, yeah. Interesting. How weird is that? Yeah. So it's, it's a behaviorally induced pathology. I, I, I had not thought when I brought up that example of sexually dimorphic pathology. Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes perfect sense Absolutely now that you say it, it because males and females of species often have different behaviors and influences males tend to do real stupid I was stuff say, if we were able to pull up emergency room records i'm sure we would see 
a distinction. A, a dimorphic. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Another uh, thing that it made me think of is like a good example of a, a an injury that is just kind of wholesale on a species is um, the Greenland shark. Uh, as far as I know, my understanding. So Greenland sharks are these really big, like great white sized sharks that live deep, deep down in the cold, cold waters. Very slow moving, but they are almost all blind, not because they've reduced their eyes, but they all have parasites in their eyes Ew. that have caused them to go blind. But they live down in perpetual darkness, so they're not so they don't using their eyes, but they have not evolved away the eye. The, they just all, like every video I've ever seen, and I saw one that mentioned that, yeah, they basically all have those eye parasites. Wow. So it's an injury. That's caused them to go blind, but it's just, that's something that all these sharks basically have. It's kind of like, I know there are certain, dis- like, uh, bacteria that basically all humans have in your system, and it's not that you were born with it. It's just, yeah, that's a human thing. You have that germ in you somewhere. Yeah. So we can get the, what, what, are there other cool things you can learn from pathologies? So what are, what are the cool ways we get insight into ancient life? Oh, that is a, that is a. Big question. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really and good I know question. we'll go into examples I was gonna say, <laughs> later. We can, we can touch on those examples as we go along because I have all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> oh, sure, Yay. sure. Yeah. Well, one other question that I want to ask is, you know, we're talking about this. How do you identify pathologies? How do you distinguish pathology from something that isn't pathology? I imagine that there are certain tricks that you run into with fossils that you don't see with modern stuff. How does pathology interact with the process of fossilization? That's that's a that's a great question. <laughs> and I like to I like this one example. There's I've got several good examples, but this one's my favorite. <laughs> this one was awesome. It was a study done on these birds, specifically domestic birds like chickens on this Polynesian island. And the people were going on about how something like 80% of the population of these chickens had this hypertrophic bone thickening disease. And my question was, well, okay, but if it's bird bones, they don't preserve very well. So the ones that have a disease that thickens their bones are more likely to fossilize. Mm -hmm. Because it takes a lot more effort to get rid of a really thick bone than a really thin little baby fragile bird bone. So are you seeing just a preservation bias? In that population. And so you're saying, oh, well, all of these birds have this thing. Well, those are just the ones that survived those in the fossil record. Uh, so you have to be really careful about the assumptions that you make. Another great example, and uh, Will, you'll appreciate this mm. one because it's a crock. Yay! <laughs> just for you. I'm ready. Um, this was Palomnarchus. So it's from the Pliocene, yes, the Pliocene from in Queensland. Mm-hmm. And they'd found a fracture in its femur. And the distal, the very bottom portion of the femur is gone, as is the lower limb. And they're like, oh, maybe it was amputated in life. So what happened was there was a fracture and then also bite marks. So the thought was that a larger, probably and probably a larger croc had Mm -hmm. bitten it and broken its femur. And they're like, well, if the bottom of the femur is gone and the lower limb is gone, maybe it was bitten off. Yeah. Well, that's cool, but you only found the femur. (laughs) Like, you didn't find the whole skeleton and then no lower leg. You just found a femur with a broken end. And part of what they talked about in the paper was that there had been a post-mortem or after-death scavenging on it. So, like, you're already talking that other animals have chewed on this thing after it died. So you're making these big arm-waving assumptions about it being amputated. So you got to be careful. There's, yeah. there's, thin, there's lines. I imagine that the opposite would be true uh, with something like that first example... Or, or basically, if you have a, a disease or something that thins the bone, right. or pre- predation on bone, could just remove it entirely from the fossil record. Absolutely. There could be, you know, if, if a species was prone to a certain disease, we might just not know about it. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, because uh, I've gotten that question on tours before when talking about injuries and, in, in, you know, looking at for damage in the bones... Um, when we're looking at fossils, is how do you distinguish between a break before or after death? Mm-hmm. And you know, my, my answer has always been we look for signs of healing. Mm-hmm. If we don't have those, then if this is the break that killed you, then yeah, it's you might not be able to determine right. which one it was. So there's, there's pre-mortem, which is you know well before you die, 
anti-mortem, which is after you die. So that would be like die and you're dug up and when someone hits you with a shovel, your arm breaks. Like yeah, that is yep, yep. post-mortem, like it's not, that's not related to your death. Or in the case of Grey, you know, our Macedon fell down a cliff, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, it might have already been dead when some of these breaks happen. Like, it's hard to say. So when there's a Grey line, or Grey area, it's called perimortem. So anything before about 13 days before death. Okay. You won't have evidence of healing for about two weeks. So if you break your limb and then die because you can't get to the watering hole, it's hard to say if it's the break that killed you or that dehydration that killed you or or what happened if a bone is broken and and there's no evidence of healing yeah it's just hard to say exactly and i mean two weeks that's enough time for a lot of complex pathology like there's lots of things that can kill you in two weeks yeah absolutely well that's interesting because i had heard the phrase perimortem and i guess i had kind of assumed it meant during death Mm. like that this is the injury that happened when you died this is the um when they're saying all their goodbyes to their family and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but no, two weeks. It, perimortem means indistinguishable from the moment of death. Yes, interesting. Right. Wow. Well, it sounds like there are is a lot of cool variety, and I know you've brought some fun examples. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, in the second portion of our discussion, we'll go a little bit more into depth, particularly in the differences between injury pathologies and disease-caused pathologies, and maybe some other fun stuff. So stay tuned. So we mentioned that one of the big sort of categories of pathology is injuries in the fossil record. And I want to know more about that. So what, uh, in a little more detail than we've discussed already, what does an injury look like? So with an injury, what you'll see more often than not, as opposed to a disease, is at least mild offset. So if you have a break, particularly without modern medicine, and even to an extent with modern medicine, like a raccoon that breaks its leg is not going to be in a splint, taking care of it, taking it easy. These animals with broken bones... They have to go out and find food. They have to survive. And bone will not heal exactly right. You'll always be able to see just a little bit of something, even if it's almost perfectly remodeled. And a good example of that is our rhinoc- one of our big rhinoceroses at Gray, is Big Boy. And he has an extremely well-healed rib fracture. Mm-hmm. And if you just look at a portion of the rib, just like, say, the left half of the rib, it looks perfectly fine. And then you look at the rest of it and realize that it is actually fused to the rib next to it. Like, oh, that's not Ooh. right. But the bone is perfectly smooth. It looks healthy, mm-hmm. except for the fact that it's two ribs fused together. Yeah. So the assumption there is that it's a fracture. It's called a comminuted fracture, which means multiple pieces. So instead of just a simple fracture where it's, oh, I fell out of a tree and I broke my arm and it broke in half, we put it back together. A comminuted fracture is more like a crushing injury. Ooh, yeah, wow. well, not Ugh. good. But that's how you get all of the different pieces of the two ribs mixing together. Yeah. But it's so well healed, it's an extremely old injury. A bone remodels completely after about 10 years. Your entire bone is replaced in 10 years. That was one of my favorite facts uh, I ever learned. Yeah, cool. Back is that your skeleton is no more than 10 years old. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. So does that mean that if an animal had an injury early in its life, but then survived more than 10 years past that, we might not see it in a fossil? That's not quite. There'll usually be, well, nearly always there'll be at least some remnant of it. Which again, going back, in a human it might be different, because with modern medicine you can set it perfectly and take your x-rays and put pins in and do all the things that you need to do. With an animal, it'll probably always be at least some sign. So it's slightly wrong. The slightly wrong, but the bone may look perfectly healthy. Um, yeah, that, it doesn't have that sponginess, that frothiness right. that you mentioned before. But there will always be kind of a, a lump where the original callus was formed. So even if the callus is perfectly smooth, it's still just not quite right with the, you know, kind of the silhouette of the bone. Right. But, it's always going to be just a little wonky. What this makes me think of is like welding metal. Uh, I don't know how many people out there have gotten to weld metal for but like when you weld you are melting the two pieces of metal together so it is a really strong joint 
but it's still the weakest point. Like, no matter how well you weld it, if it's going to break, it's typically going to break there because that's where two pieces were put together. So it's never a perfect, solid piece of metal. And it makes sense that with bones, once you've taken a perfectly grown bone and broken it in half, it's never going to be a perfectly grown bone again. Like It's, it's not going to be a perfectly developed bone, but because of the way the callus is formed and the way the bone remodels on it, the break usually will not break again. Yeah. So if you have... So take Big Boy again, for example. If he falls and breaks his rib, and he falls again and lands on the exact same spot, the rib will break again, but not at the exact same spot. It'll break slightly above or below that original fracture. Because that part's thick. That part's extra thick now. Ah, that actually makes sense. So typically you will not re-break a bone in the same spot. It's like it's like when you sew a seam and you have a rip next to your sew. Yeah. Because your, yeah. your thread is actually stronger <laughs> than the fabric now. <laughs> Now, I'm sure you have more examples of injuries, and there's more to talk about. But the other thing that I want to touch on here is this question of what we learn from pathological injuries. And I I already know the answer to this question, but I want our <laughs> listeners to know it. Can you talk about what that big boy injury... And, and I know big boy has multiple injuries. Yes. What, what do those tell us about this rhino? Uh, big boy is an interesting fellow because he has so many pathologies. Uh, he's got at least three really noticeable good ones. So the one is the two ribs that are fused together, the comminuted fracture I talked about that's well remodeled and nice and healthy. Uh, he does have a, and I just mentioned a bone not breaking in the same place twice, he's got a, another section of broken rib on the same rib, uh, slightly higher, just a little bit higher, that is much younger. And you can tell it's much younger because it's crunchier and frothier and it's obviously years away from being as healthy looking as the rib section below it. And so those are two different injuries. So I'll talk about the toes first and then I'll talk about okay. the, <laughs> the, the methodology that's hypothesized. Uh, the other interesting thing that he's got is on his, one of his back feet, his inside toe has been crushed. So the, so each toe has three bones in it. So you have your three phalanges and your metatarsal. The, two bottom the very bottom phalanges have been crushed into each other and have formed a single bone so technically he only has two phalanges in that one inside toe <laughs> and the phalange on top of those I mean, they're they're remodeled and arthritic and lumpy and they just don't look healthy they're i mean obviously something is wrong with them uh there's some deformation on the metatarsal as well just he had, he had a bad time <laughs> But the question was, how does a rhinoceros's inside back toe get squished? Like, if you're standing there and you're looking at your feet, it's basically his, the equivalent of his big toe, the inside ones. So I'm, I'm on YouTube and I'm watching videos of rhinos fighting. Fighting, 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 and I'm watching to see if their back feet come into contact at all. And they really don't because they're fighting with their heads. Mm -hmm. And they're spinning and they're tush hogging and they're doing all this stuff. But their back feet don't get close to each other. They do get close to each other when they're mating. Yeah. <laughs> they get right up in there. Uh, and so the current hypothesis is that very possibly a female, perhaps not appreciating his advantage, had stepped back onto his toe and crushed it. <laughs> and again, this is one of those unfortunate bits on paleopathology where you can't prove it, but it seems the most likely hypothesis. So it's parsimony. It's the most simple explanation is probably the right one. Right. That, that his dancing partner had two left feet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the, um, the other fun part about Big Boy is that I mentioned earlier when I was introducing myself that I do modern prep. Well, we have a rhinoceros specimen from a zoo that was donated to us, and he had a broken rib on the same rib as Big Boy. Cool. Like, oh, this is great. Because we were able to call the vet and say, hey, doctor, uh, what happened to this rhino? And the vet was able to say, oh, yeah, we were wondering about that. He fell off a female during mating when he was younger. <laughs> and we, we wondered if he'd broken anything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the foot injury and the ribs in, rib injuries... Plausibly. Plausibly both <laughs> mating related. Ah! Oh, ah! <laughs> well, he had a bad time. That was, was a really bad date. 
funnily enough, that's not the first time we've talked about mating injuries yeah. on the podcast because episode 53 was the baculum episode. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yep. I have a collection of pathological raccoon baculum. Yeah. House. <laughs> and the baculum, dear listeners, for those of you who haven't listened to episode 53, is a bone that many mammals have that supports the soft tissue of the male genitalia. And we read a study uh, uh, from La Brea about dire wolf bacula talking about how a lot of carnivorans, a lot of carnivorous mammals will often get injuries in the back, broken bacula because of mating competition. When the males are fighting over control of the female in the moment. Mm -hmm. So we've got broken bones and we've got crushed toes and stuff. (laughs) What other kinds of injuries can you get? And what, what, what other sort of insights can we get from pathological injury? Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is a dissertation by, I think her name was Suzanne Ware, and she did, talking about the direwolves again at La Brea, she did her dissertation on an analysis of the pathologies in all of the direwolves, and specifically how that would affect that wolf's standing in the pack, based on how the pathology would affect its ability to perform those social cues and the postures that it needed to. So if you had a wolf with a spinal injury, it might not be able to roll over submissively or play bow or all of the different things. If it had a broken tail, could it perform the tail postures that it needed to to effectively communicate with the rest of the pack? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like if you have a damaged hand, sign language is going to be more difficult. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Which is really neat. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's fun thinking about those side effects of injuries that you typically wouldn't consider you know like uh, like compensating with the other limbs that was you mentioned earlier but like you know if you have an injured foot yes it's gonna make it hard to walk but it also means you can't run and play which may affect your social standing which may affect your you know where you fall out in the gr- yeah that's a how oh, now i'm just running through other animals <laughs> now here's a fun example of uh, talking about compensation again there's a process it's called pseudarthrosis, and what it means is a false joint. And it typically happens in animals. It doesn't happen in people, because if we dislocate something, just pop it back in, <laughs> problem solved. A sloth can't do that. So there's a great example of a sloth that had dislocated its radius in life, one of its forearm bones, and actually bumped the radius up to where it was basically articulating with its humerus, and it formed a false glenoid bossa, basically where it still had the ulna, but the radius had formed a depression on the front of the humerus to where it was just articulating with that for the rest of its life. So it made a new joint. It made, yep, a pseudarthrosis, a false joint. And I've got a cat pelvis in my collection where a cat had dislocated its femur and broken its femur, probably fell out of a tree or hit by a car or something. But it lived for years and years. Well, the head of the femur, the ball and socket joint, had popped out and rested on the pelvis, and the pelvis remodeled to make a new hip socket for it. Wow. Oh, it's wild. Animals want to survive. Yeah. Yeah, well, it makes me think of... uh, I've seen examples of trees that will get something stuck in the wood and then grow around. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll see trees growing around poles, or I've I've seen trees growing around cannonballs from, like, you know, hundreds of years ago. Saw one with a bike in it. Yeah. Yeah. But I've also seen examples in fossils of bone doing that, where you'll see, like, this herbivorous animal has a tooth from a predator that bit it, lost the tooth, stuck in the bone, and then the bone just grew around the tooth. Mm -hmm. And now you have a tooth in you. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Once again, our bones are much more flexible and and responsive than than they seem to be. You know, they seem to be just, like rocks in our body they're perceived as being extremely static yes but they're not not at all oh that's so cool now i do want to move on and talk about disease yes but if you have any other cool examples of injuries you want to share go right ahead okay because i I, and i ask that knowing that you absolutely have something 100 (laughs) percent have this one's really cool y'all are gonna love this one so this is actually the oldest fracture that's ever been found Ever. Ooh. Yeah. I have a whole list of superlatives. Cool. A bunch of oldest. That's, <laughs> that's great. So the oldest fracture is in a uh, early, early tetrapod. Uh, it's called Ocenotus pueri. 
and it's the right radius, so it's its right forearm bone, and it's from Australia. So it's 333 million years old, because they've got really good dating on the formation that it was found in. So 333 million years old, which is pretty good. <laughs> um, and it had broken its radius, and they did finite force analysis and found that in order to break the bone the way it had, it must have fallen from a height of 85 centimeters, which is roughly three feet. Okay. Which is super cool because if it's this early tetrapod, it was previously thought to not be super terrestrial. Well, if it's breaking its arm, it's obviously on land, which also pushed terrestriality back two million years before we thought it was, and suggests that terrestriality evolved in Gondwana, not in Eurasia, from one bone! Wow, we didn't even mention that in episode 77 when we talked about the move on to land. Yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. Isn't that cool? What a cool inference to say you have an injury that only would have happened if you lived in this habitat. Yeah. yeah. That's such a cool finding. It makes me think of those, I don't know if you guys ever did these, uh, when I was in school we would do, do these um, brain teaser things that are, uh, you know, here's this list of people. And here's a couple of hints about them, and you have right, to figure right. out. Annie knows this about Tim. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Tim wasn't there, but he was. You know, he heard that you know, that stuff. That feels very much like that. Of like, here's a break in the bone that only happens if you fall this far. Mm-hmm. Proceed. Yeah. <laughs> the Temnus fondle was found in a puddle of water, <laughs> and there was no other <laughs> evidence. <laughs> so let's talk about disease. Okay. So this, I feel like these are sort of like the two big categories. Yes. Injury and disease. So what does disease look like as opposed to injury? So with disease, you typically won't have an offset because the bone itself has not been broken in any way. Um, But with disease, what you'll find are pits and draining sinuses and... Yeah, I know. Whoa. It's nasty. Um, You'll find... We we asked you to use family language. (laughs) 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 Um, and you'll see things like uh hypertrophy or the bone being excessively thick or bone being thinner than it's supposed to be you'll see rugose texturing where you might not otherwise Uh, this goes hand in hand with the injury where a simple fracture that's clean within the skin not broken it won't really get an infection so it'll be kind of frothy because like i said the cancellous the inside part of the bone is on the outside. With a disease, with an infection, it's it's nasty. The bone is super spongy and it it's full of little vesicles and it just doesn't look right. It's kind of crazy that like breaks are by far the more violent injury. You know, it's it's you are snapping a bone, which is no small feat. But disease just seems so much more. Insidious. This, yes, in cities, well, it's so it's, much more disturbing. It's in there messing with stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not a quick break and a quick fix. It's this has been damaged for a while. Ew. So, can you tell the difference? You, you, you know, we, the scientific community, <laughs> can it be told the difference between disease by bacteria, by virus, by fungus versus parasites? Or does that, like Will said before, is it like a symptom, that like a runny nose, where it's like, well, this could be any number of those. Yeah, bone reacts to invasion in only so many ways. Well, I love that you mentioned specifically virus versus bacteria versus fungus, because there's a great way to tell those. I've got good examples in plants. Um, there's not a lot of pathology in plants. Pretty much if you Google paleopathology of plants, there's one paper but it's a cracking good one. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I, I guess we should make the point that we have been using the word pathology in this episode both to relate, to, to refer to the study of it and to the actual things. Yes. Is that how it is? That's that's just how it is. Okay, there is, cool. I do pathology <laughs> on pathologies. Because <laughs> you, right, cool. you said there's not much pathology in plants, and I knew what you meant but that was the uh, the moment that I realized we haven't actually explained this. The <laughs> pathology means the study of it, but it also just means the thing. Yes, it's a little self referential. Yes, yeah. So sorry to interrupt no, you, no, but no, go ahead. No. Um, so with plants, uh, she found these great like fungus responses and these Cretaceous angiosperms, and I know y'all talked about angiosperms a while ago, mm-hmm. episode fifty-seven. Yeah, there you go. 
I love that you know that off the top of your yes. head. Yeah. <laughs> I, it used to be a thing I did to entertain Will, and now he's used to it, <laughs> but it entertains all our guests. <laughs> nice. Um, so specifically uh, fungus in the angiosperm, so there'd be these rings of fungus and these discolorations and these gross going on with them. And I don't know, I will be the first one to say that I don't know anything about plants, so this mm-hmm. is kind of a, oh, gee whiz, that's cool. But I didn't really <laughs> understand what she was talking about. Um, she also had, uh, so Permian, uh, y'all talked about the Permian a little bit, mm-hmm. um, the Glossopterids. Right, right. Yeah. Famous. So these are a famous group of plants that are, are, are they, they're famous for being found across multiple continents and being one of the examples of an organism that demonstrated that Pangaea existed when yeah. the continents were right, together. Right, right, right. So this paper had a bunch of great examples of insect damage in these Permian Glossopterids. Oh, so the cool. insects would be chewing on them and there would be this ring of like necrotized plant tissue around the bites as the plant tried to kind of sequester the damage and protect itself from the rest of the, the damage. Oh. Yeah. That's cool. I had a professor at Penn State when I was an undergrad, Peter Wolf, who studied insect feeding traces on plants mm. where you would get distinct, almost like footprints, except their mouth part <laughs> cause so it's like a you know the tread of a tractor across the plant except that it's different depending on what insect was chewing on it it's like looking for bite marks like mm-hmm. you know it, yeah, if, yeah. if i have a if, if it didn't remove the part it bit i can identify what shark bit you yeah <laughs> by measuring the teeth well and i know we've seen i have seen at least one example at gray of a fossilized stick like a twig that has what appears to be a gall in it. Mm -hmm. Which today you'll see a twig with like this bulbous growth, usually because an insect got in there and is plugging up the works and is causing the plant to react in a way that creates this little bulb. Well, this paper actually talked about the 13 different types of galls that are present in the Miocene. Oh, that's so (gasps) cool! cool? (laughs) Yeah, this same paper also was talking about the... So nematodes have essentially zero fossil record. Mm -hmm. Um, And this paper was talking about the one example in the fossil record of a Devonian plant-based nematode. So imagine that you have a fossil of a nematode in the Devonian and then nothing else (laughs) forever, (laughs) except for this one plant that had the nematode. Wow. It's amazing what you can find. You just got to get lucky enough. Yeah, exactly. So you made the comment before that injuries can get infected. Yes. So that leads me to a question. Okay. Would would it not be so that injury pathologies and disease pathologies often come coupled? Absolutely. And this leads me to a great topic. Oh, boy. <laughs> Miss Sue. Sue the Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Sue the famous T-Rex yes. uh, over in the Field Museum. Mm-hmm. Sue, Sue had a rough life. Um, she has an infected fibula. She's got multiple fractured ribs. Uh, there's evidence on one of her humeri that her tricep or bicep had been torn off. Uh, <laughs> wow! Unacceptable. <laughs> Ooh, it's a hard life for a T-Rex. Yeah. Well, they also were ident- able to identify face-biting behaviors in these theropods because they have these bite marks on their face. Well, there's been a fairly recent study that is suggesting that instead of Sue dying of old age or whatever, she actually died of a really common bird disease. Um, It's called trichomonosis. Uh, It's caused by the, I think it's a bacteria, uh, trichomonas gallinae. So basically, bird. Yeah. Gallus. It's chicken, isn't it? Yeah, it's chicken. Uh, So pigeons apparently carry it. Something like 80% of all pigeons have this disease. And what happens is that it gets into the throat and the pharynx and all the, you know, juicy stuff underneath your chin, and it forms these lesions, and the animal will actually, the bird will actually starve to death because it can't swallow. Oh. Because its throat is swollen and painful and it can't swallow. So the thought is that this bacteria, if it's being carried in dinosaurs the way it's being carried in birds, was introduced to the whole system through the face biting. So you get these puncture wounds that are absolute puncture wounds, but then associated with those wounds you have these bacterial pits in the bone. So the thought was like, well, Sue had essentially, like, quote-unquote, unquote, bird flu and starved <laughs> to death. Wow. So you'll see a, a, a hole mm-hmm. that is from a tooth. Yes. Right, a hole that is presumably the shape and size of a tooth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then additional pitting, which is what, the, is it just the bacteria eating away at yeah, bone? Yeah, it's affecting the osteoblasts. So, so 
it's not building up new bone there, it's actually just eating away at the bone. Uh, and what's cool, another way to tell the difference between a puncture wound versus a bacterial wound is that with a puncture wound, you'll actually see the bone compressed in on itself. Well, that makes you can sense. see the fragments. It's mechanical damage. Exactly. With a bacteria, it's just the bone is not there. And it so does not exist. To to emphasize what you were asking as well, the when you have those pits, it's not that the bacteria is eating the bone. It's causing our natural processes to only remove bone. Yeah. Which right, is, right. yeah, it is not what uh, typically is people present it as. It is always seen as the bacteria. Right, like acid. Like, yeah, like acid or like termites in your bone. Mm-hmm. But it's just stopping the bone from reforming yeah, it's, itself. Yeah, it's affecting the chemistry of our own body and kind of turning it against us. Which is weird and scary. scary. Yeah, that's worse. <laughs> yeah. That's worse than so, eating away at the bone. Yeah, our, that, our that at least would be relatable. <laughs> <laughs> our cells will react to the bacterial cells like they will... They'll basically start taking orders from the bacteria. Oh, <gasps> horrifying! Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, and again, it's all very you know wibbly wobbly chemistry. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> microbes, man. Unacceptable. I mean, we we are sitting here right now at the mercy of microbes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, once again, there are other questions that I want to ask you. Yes. But if you have another favorite disease example got another good disease go example. ahead well so, okay so, <laughs> oh okay so, just one <laughs> thanks guys <laughs> so this one isn't i mean it's still technically it's still paleopathology but it's not an animal this is a human this is utzi the ice man <gasps> oh yeah so yeah. explain utzi real quick utzi is a gentleman that was found in the alps oh gosh i forget how old he is he is several Sick. thousand yeah. Several, several thousand years old. Um, and he, is, he has been able to open up so much information. We've gotten so much info out of him. We know what he ate and that he was lactose intolerant <laughs> and the color of his eyes. Oh, yeah. Didn't he have tattoos? Yeah, he had lactose. And I'm going to get to the tattoos. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm jumping the gun. <gasps> this is even so. so <laughs> I, I'm a big Utsi nerd. <laughs> there was a documentary about Utsi. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> um, the cool thing about Utsi is that he had Lyme disease. And the only reason that we know that is because, I say, again, this is royal we, we scientists, uh, they've taken a sample of tissue from around his pelvis to kind of sequence out his DNA. And what they found was they actually found a partial genome of uh, Borrelia bugdorfi, which is a great name. Yeah, that's but fantastic. That's the Sounds back- like something from Harry Potter. I was about to say, it does, yeah. <laughs> Borrelia bugdorfi. Yeah. <laughs> he, was in, and fl- he, he was in Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. Um, and the thought is that as the Lyme disease affected his joints and caused pain, he put the tattoos around it to treat the pain. <sighs> ah, how? how? Cool. It's like, well, it's either shamanistic mysticism. Yeah, yeah. That, the belief that tattooing this thing will have a healing effect. Or kind of a primitive form of acupuncture where... You tattoo yourself; it releases the endorphins, and the pain is masked for a time. It's kind of like uh, a like a like a paleontological tens unit. Yeah. Trans electro neural. You sending electronic mm-hmm. electric pulses across a pain spot to right, block right. the pain. To mess it up. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Well, that actually transitions beautifully into the next thing I wanted to ask, okay. which is when we were planning this episode, you mentioned that you had a bunch of cool examples about pathologies in the study of ancient humans. Yeah. So my question is, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so pathology of humans, I don't know why it's not called archaeopathology, but it's just paleopathology. I guess because the word was developed with animals originally and then the archaeologists took it. <laughs> That's our word. Um, so there's been lots of studies done on folks in colonial times and ancient humans and you know, from prehistory and then Romans and Greeks and, and everything. Um, but you can tell a lot about human behavior from the pathologies. You can tell nutritional deficits that they might have had, or like an example would be scurvy. You can see scurvy in the bones, Ooh. which is cool. Uh, really? So what it does is it forms it forms this peri- sub-periosteal bone. And what that means is, so there's a, there's a very thin covering on your bone called the periosteum, and... What subperiosteal bone is, it's bone that's forming underneath that layer. And so it's going, you know, all chemistry and it's an imbalance. So what you have is 
the vitamin C that you need to prevent scurvy um, is also closely tied with ascorbic acid, which you need in collagen synthesis within the bone. So if you don't have your ascorbic acid, you're not producing the collagen the way you need it to. Uh, you also, that Without the collagen, your bones get incredibly brittle. So okay. Collagen is what allows right. them to bend and flex. So you'll see increased uh, instances of fractures because the bones are super brittle. And then also the um, excess bone growth. Particularly, I keep gesturing at my jaws and I'm getting there. <laughs> right. <laughs> because when in scurvy, it kind of goes through the bloodstream. And so what you'll find is uh, lines of the subperiosteal bone following the major nerve and or, uh, veins in your skull. Oh. So you'll see it along the jaw. Mm. Right, and I'm gesturing where there's a vein. You can't yeah, see it, but yeah. there's a vein. That Listeners, runs... this is great. <laughs> <laughs> there's a vein that runs alongside your jaw. So, like, if you take your finger and you rub it down your jaw, um, that's kind of where there's a vein, and you'll see scurvy evidence in the bones along the jaw, and specifically up underneath, like, in your soft palate area, where it's highly innervated. Very cool. It's creepy and gross. Yeah, scurvy's scary. It's scary. <laughs> um Pathology, so paleopathology can also give uh, lots of examples. People will interpret them differently in humans than they would in animals. So, like, if you see an animal with a deformed limb, you go, wow, I can't believe, like, that animal's a real tough cookie. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it survived. With a human, if a human has, like, a congenitally shortened limb or an arm or something like that, and they're like, oh, wow, I can't believe it survived. It must have had help. Yep, right, right. And I recently read a really cool paper talking about how there's so much interpretation of compassion in the human pathological record. You say, oh, this person obviously couldn't have survived without help. It's like, well, I mean, that's kind of, you're not giving them a lot of credit. Yeah, a little yeah. insulting. <laughs> yeah, right. a little insulting. Like, <laughs> I, I could survive without that finger, thank you very much. But, like, this person had dwarfism. Obviously, they could not keep up with the rest of the tribe. Like, no, like, little kids keep up with their parents. Like, mm -hmm. just because you're short doesn't mean you're incapable of anything. Mm -hmm. Or just because your left arm doesn't work properly doesn't mean you're not... Like, okay, you couldn't hunt. You could absolutely be foraging. You could be helping. Like, they're not just sitting there accepting help. So they make all these weird assumptions, which I don't understand. Yeah, I feel like a lot of those go along with the stuff that typically can coincide with interpreting ancient people that it is it is real difficult for us to see them as not primitive humans. Right. As they are just old humans, <laughs> they're just humans right, for a right. long time. But I saw a, a reconstruction of a Neanderthal that uh, not too long ago, where they you had them with feathers in their hair and everything, mm -hmm. and it was the, one of the first and only times I can think of where I saw a Neanderthal just reconstructed as a human, just just as a native person, you know, with with the decorations humans have always been putting on themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? And it's like, yeah, we're in we're ingenuitous we're creative we will figure out a way to survive if we can and we've not just been we weren't just stupid back then right <laughs> right and i feel like it's a combination of assuming that ancient humans were too primitive mm -hmm. but also assuming that ancient humans were too modern yeah. yeah in the thought of like i would not survive this kind of injury and no one that i know would survive this kind of injury either because we're not accustomed to to the kind of lifestyle you would need for that yeah, we're, we're making those we're drawing those conclusions from a couch right exactly <laughs> or the idea that we've never you it's easy to assume that if somebody lost their arm and didn't go to the hospital then that oh that's it then that's just the end of you yeah without taking into account that no animals lose their arms and then oh. go on yeah. all the time <laughs> And yeah, no, a human could do it. It's just outside of our normal experience because modern humans have all the luxuries of we're soft. Yeah, we're very we're very soft and and wimpy well, and organisms. I can see psychologically, you know, the idea of pre hospitals, pre tech, you know, modern technology having your arm or leg or other serious injury, you know, just something totally destroyed. That's unfair fathomably horrific right you don't want to think about it. yeah like when it happens to a crocodile it's like sure whatever yeah exactly yeah. but surely you must have died after that because <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> like i can see i could see that that just mentality of that seems too horrific too violent to be something that you could walk off did you have any other human 
examples you wanted to share? I do. So these ones aren't specifically related to humans in and of themselves, but what the pathology tells about the humans kind of peripheral to that. So I talked about that dog with the broken shoulder and the compensating muscles on its other side. It had been buried, which is kind of interesting, and it had been buried with a little bit of ornamentation. So one of the oh, thoughts yeah. was like, oh, maybe it was somebody's pet. That's kind of cool. But but going on a different direction, um, talking about domestication. So you'll start to notice different patterns of pathologies in animals that have been domesticated as opposed to their wild counterparts. You do not see arthritis in wild cattle. Like, you would not find arthritis in an auroc. Mm -hmm. They can't move. They're dead. Yeah. Simply put. With domestic animals, they can survive with arthritis and crippling injuries a lot better when they have a little human support. But humans can also cause pathologies themselves. Not like beating the animal, but just simple the way the animals were being used. Mm -hmm. For example, um, dogs of native peoples, like ancient Native American civilizations, would use dogs as draft animals before horses were reintroduced. And what you see on the ancient dogs is patterns of arthritis that are similar to what you see in sled dogs today. Because they're pulling heavy loads. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, so it's not that these dogs are being mistreated anyway, it's just a factor of the jobs that they're doing. Yeah, it's it's carpal tunnel, but in dogs. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> so this is like what we were talking about before, where you have a what is technically a pathology that is just indicating a behavior. Right. But in this case, it is a human-induced behavior in a domesticant. Yes. Also, dogs as draft animals. I didn't know about that. That's that crazy. Cool? Because what, what else were they going to use? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, if, if you only have dogs, uh, and I'm not pulling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, listen, Fido, one of us has got to pull this this cart. Well, they were saying that they would use dogs to pull loads up to like 100 pounds. That's a, that's a good weight off yeah. of yourself. Like yeah. was, if you had a whole pack of them, you could really move. Pretty cool. And one last good example is this example of bamboo spine in a migration period horse. I think it was in Mongolia or Hungary. By the way, this horse had this. This horse was only nine years old. Which, if you're horse people, that is not old. That is <laughs> that is young middle age. That's like forty. <laughs> Still going strong. Seventeen of this horse's vertebrae were fused together. Seventeen whoa, whoa. of them, nearly the entire back, I was from say, hip how, to shoulder. How many vertebrae does a horse have? <laughs> <laughs> not, not many more than seventeen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's horrible. It, Oh, it's it's really weird when you see figures of it. Uh, it also had developed some arthritis in one of its back hooves because it was so crippled. Like, its motion was obviously affected. And the thought... And it's not... I reread the paper to refresh my memory. And it's not that it's solely caused by people, but certainly humans are a mechanism for it. Um, before people really knew much about the physiology of their horses, they were overridden. Yeah. And so you were putting excessive strain on these horses, and they were... Smaller, like the sauropods, are fusing their lig or they're ossifying their ligaments and they're fusing all these bones together as a response to that mechanical stress that's yeah. being put on them, probably unknowingly. Like you choose, like it's not like, oh, ha ha, horses can date. No, it's just how would you know yeah, until yeah. suddenly your horse couldn't move right anymore. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. It's so weird. Well, we we've talked a lot about injury and disease and pathology in sort of the broader sense. Mm -hmm. But before we end the episode, the reason that we asked you, Laura, to be our paleopathology guest is because this is something you've done. Yes. And so could you tell us a little bit here at the end of the episode about your own pathology research? What, what sort of work have you done? Absolutely. So um, I was, so unfortunately the big boy stuff never did get published because they kept wanting us to go in and do the CT scanning and do the x-rays of these bones. And it's like, well, I it's a broken rib like yeah i don't have funding for that yeah like, i'm sorry <laughs> so that hasn't ended up getting published but i did i was able to present a poster this was originally going to be my thesis but i ended up not having quite enough to say so i went with a different topic but i did an analysis of our large population of tapers at gray and compared them to the large populations of tapers down in florida at a similar time period so all of their different sites Hail mostly because they have nearly as many tapers as we do. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the patterns of pathologies. How many fractures were there? How many evidence? How many instances of arthritis? Any kind of dental issues? And compared the proportions. So how are the tapers in Florida behaving versus the tapers in Tennessee? 
And what I found is that both populations had lots of arthritis, more so in gray than Florida. Uh, Florida had higher instances of traumatic pathology, so broken bones. Uh, one taper actually was missing all of the incisors on one half of its face, and its jaw had flared out to form a pad so that it can still continue to eat. So it was basically eating on its jaw instead Ugh. of its teeth. Ugh. Ooh, Ooh, that sounds yeah. terrible. Yeah. Animals want to live. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was interesting to note that the proportions of trauma in Florida were higher because Florida also has um, far more carnivorous fossils. They've got more cats and more dogs and more bears and everything else. So it makes sense that if you're living in an area that has more predators, you're going to be injured more. At Gray, it's mostly arthritis. There's a couple of instances of what we've been calling a degloving injury, um, my co-author. The thought was that here's these tapers and they're stomping around in the underbrush. Often at night, if they tripped on a log, there's not a lot of skin. Like, feel the top of your wrist. There's not a lot of meat there protecting you. Here we are all sitting yeah. here yeah. by our yeah. wrists. <laughs> uh, if a taper is walking through the underbrush and it scrapes its forelimb on a stick, well, then that um, the bone surface is potentially exposed. And here they are stomping in the slop, in the water, in the everything. There is a high chance of getting infected there. So what you'll see is that the front of all of the carpal bones, the wrist bones, the fronts of them have this osteomyelitis, this frothy, spongy, gross texture, but not the back. So it's not just old age arthritis. Something happened to the front of the wrist. It's it's a, then the equivalent of like skinning your knee, but just exactly while walking through underbrush. Yep. Which, and then leaving damage on your bones. Yeah, yep, mm-hmm. yeah. No, I stopped touching, <laughs> touching my wrist after you <laughs> went into more detail. <laughs> um, but the tapers at Gray are also, they are old individuals. So the thought is it's kind of like a retirement community. Yeah. We have hardly any carnivorous fossils. You know, in 20 years we found two tooth fragments of a cat, one small bear skull, one barophagine dog question mark, yeah. arm <laughs> bone, and that's it. Florida, they've got lots of stuff. So this probably would have been a pretty good area to be a taper. Yeah. Nice and old. Um, Snaper is a good one. That one's the only one of our only tapers that has a nickname. Yeah. And Snaper <laughs> is incredibly old. Think Snaper is a she? I call it a she. Just because I think I heard someone say it was a female. <laughs> uh, probably Aaron. He did the sexual dimorphism stuff. Either way, she, uh, her teeth are worn down incredibly flat. The dentin is exposed. Uh, several teeth are missing. And they actually found, when they were excavating her, they found whole hickory nuts inside her stomach. So the thought was that her teeth were so worn that she couldn't chew anymore, and she was just swallowing them whole. <laughs> and she is riddled with arthritis. All of her limb bones have it. Her spine has some of it. She's she's a mess. Yeah. Wow. So, you, so you're inferring that these tapers have age-related injuries, or, or pathologies, because they were able to become aged. Yeah. Yes. That's a cool... Yeah. That, that poster's actually up on the wall. It is. In the back hallway uh, next to the lab at Gray. Yeah. yeah. That's a really cool study. Yeah, and the, the Florida yeah. tapirs show more direct injury. Right. Because of predators, not because it's Florida tapir. Like Florida man equivalents. <laughs> this type of stuff going on. <laughs> Florida tapir jumps into a sinkhole. <laughs> Hold my hickory nut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's very cool. I have... Two other questions to ask okay. before we, we end our pathology discussion. Mm-hmm. The first is earlier you gave an example with an ancient croc. Mm-hmm. And when I peeked at your notes before, I saw the word snake. Yes. <laughs> and in the interest of fairness <laughs> uh, to our listeners who will be expecting it, mm-hmm. I think that they would all like to hear about the snake I'm example. I'm sure that they would. This is a would biased you? request. <laughs> I mean, in fact, you could list like two or three snake examples. And it'd be, it'd be that good. would make it way out about the same. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, you know, in terms of actual physical weight. <laughs> well, there's, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any pathology in snakes in the fossil record, but you will see arthritis in snake vertebrae nowadays. And I know that you've seen some. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question is always, oh, is it age-related? What's happening here? Turns out, fun fact, in snakes, this quote-unquote arthritis is always caused by a bacterial infection. Oh. It is always streptococcus or salmonella, and it invades the vertebrae and forms the arthritis. So it's not the same mechanism as it is in mammals. 
It's completely different and 100% bacterial caused. Huh! Okay, so now I have a new question. Yeah. <laughs> what is arthritis? Oh. Because okay. cause you just described, I thought I knew what arthritis was because mm-hmm. it's, you know, your joints wear down or whatever as you get older. But you just it intimated that arthritis can be caused also by bacteria. <laughs> so please explain what arthritis yeah. is. <laughs> so when people use the word arthritis, they generally mean, and this is incorrect, like arthritis is a real thing. It's Arthritis just means an inflammation of the joints. And it typically presents as excess bone growth, quote-unquote, exostoses mm-hmm. around the joints. And so when people see this excess bone growth in snakes, they go, aha, excess bone, excess bone growth around a joint. It's arthritis. No, it's Yeah, it looks like, infection. sounds like, quacks like. Yeah. But, but it's not. It's not, exactly. Uh, so it, it looks like arthritis, acts like it, but it is caused by a bacteria rather than just mechanical force. And what you'll see, this is this cool thing, um, when arthritis progresses farther and farther, uh, what you'll see is eburnation. And it's a process by which the synovial fluid in your joints and your cartilage is so worn down that your bones are rubbing on each other. And they'll actually polish. And so you'll see grooves, <gasps> and the bones will lock into these grooves where they've been grinding on each other without any protection at all from the cartilage. And you see this a lot in zoo animals. The zoo animals... And I don't want to be a downer. Zoo animals are riddled with arthritis because they're so old. Yeah. They're yeah. so very old. Like a lot of times, if you take the average lifespan of an animal, a zoo or an aquarium animal is doubling that. Easy, easily. And sometimes more. <laughs> we had we had some sardines at the aquarium that were eight years old and they typically lived to be three. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's amazing. They were old fish. They were incredibly old. <laughs> I do recall seeing at the gray fossil site at least a couple instances of snake vertebrae fused. Mm-hmm. So some pathological in that, you know, they were broken or something and they ended up fused together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's cool to hear. I'll, now I want to look at our snake vertebrae for signs of arthritis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Isn't that cool? Mm. Well, my other question for you, my final question for you, okay. is... I know that you collect bones and specimens of animals and such yes. uh, quite a bit. Do you have a favorite personal specimen, pathological specimen? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So while you're thinking, I'll illustrate this for the listeners. Laura's okay. eyes have lit up <laughs> and she's looking into the distance. <laughs> mental, going through my mental catalog yeah. here. Favorite one. Oh my goodness. I have so many. Um, can I do like top two, top three? Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll be quick. So <laughs> probably one of my favorites is my buck skull. I've got a white-tailed deer. He's a buck. He's got his antlers on. And one of them was cracked partially off in life. So one of his antlers is hanging off the side of his head with this excess bone growth all around it and this big, horrible, crunchy lump while the other one is in perfect upright antler shape. <laughs> and so he's real wonky, and you can't sit him on any surface because he rocks and he tips, and you can't, he's, he's a mess. Wow. Uh, my other favorite, I bought I bought this one on eBay. I frequently look at eBay. I search for mutant bones <laughs> because people don't know what to call them. They're that, just like, this is wrong. That makes so much sense. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so you don't look for pathological bone. You look for weird bone, yeah. mutant bone. Yeah oddity bone that's wonderful and this bone was so deformed that i didn't even know what it was but i knew i needed to have it (laughs) (laughs) awesome when it finally arrived in the mail so we talked about recognizing pathologies this Mm -hmm. person obviously did not know what this was because it turned out they were holding it upside down (laughs) because but even like you it's not right yeah so i finally (laughs) i had it in my hand and i'm like oh it's a deer femur it's a juvenile deer femur so it's the upper leg bone of a deer and it must have been hit by a car because the bone has a like 90 degree offset and then another 90 degree offset <gasps> down. It's like the bone is like in a Z shape. It's it's a Tetris piece. It yeah, it's it's exactly. Yeah. Oh. This Tetris piece. I think I've seen this. I think you've shown me this. I I'm sure I have because I show it to everyone <laughs> who will stand still long enough. <laughs> Uh, There's a section of the bone where a bone fragment was broken loose and the bone formed around it, but the bone fragment is still loose, so if you shake it, it rattles, (gasps) which is super weird. Oh, creepy. Yeah. One of the condyles is completely gone. 
just gone. So the condyles are the two round bits. Like when you see like a pirate bone, yeah. two round bits at the bottom, those are the condyles. That's the part that actually articulates with your lower limb bone. It's part of your knee. And you've got two of those. One of them is just not there anymore. Who knows where it is? Wow, this deer was messed up. It was, but it lived. Yeah. It wanted to live. And that is not a sign of like pack behavior or compassion in deer. <laughs> it's an animal wanting to live. Yes. That's always the thing I keep in mind when I see a pathology that is healed. Mm -hmm. It's like, this, and the, the first time this thought was introduced to me is in that very famous walrus baculum. Yep. Yeah. That it feels like every paleontology, <laughs> you, every university I've been to, it seems to pop up. I think I've seen three or four. Yes, they just yeah. give it to you when you get your PhD. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Here's the pathological <laughs> walrus baculum. So this is a walrus penis bone. That's It's, lo it's like... A foot and a half long say, or half, something, yeah. yeah. And the middle of it is that frothy reheal that it's slightly offset. And that was the first time that it was like, yeah, here's a pathological walrus baculum. Broke its baculum. And I went, ooh, and this is where it healed. Ooh! Yeah. That <laughs> yep. was a bad couple months for Mr. Walrus. Mm -hmm. Yep. Whew. Would you uh, be able to share some photos of these with oh, us? Absolutely. So yeah. we can put them in the blog post? I'd be more than happy to. That would be wonderful. I, I like the underlying theme of our episode that so many of these injuries really drive home the message that if an animal can live, it will. Absolutely. Like, they they will fight to live. It's, and that's uh, crocs have always been one of my favorite for pathologies because they... Don't crocs survive anything. They just don't care. Nope. There is one... I, I follow a number of croc pages on facebook and instagram and there's one i can't remember his name that is missing the better half the front half of its lower jaw oh that's an important part yep uh and it's an old big croc wow yeah <laughs> because and now this one's being taken care of by people but it's still like still it's missing half it's the bottom half of its face and yeah, it's still doing well like you see ones missing limbs all the time. I talked to one person at one point, and basically they said if they've got their mouth and a tail, they're fine. Yeah. Well, that was the thing about that <laughs> that broken femur was it might have been torn off by a croc. Could there's, have. There's, absolutely, it could have. That would not have killed it. There was just no way to prove that. From yeah, but that was not the thing. only answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, Laura, thanks so much for talking to us about paleopathology. Absolutely. Happy to do it. This this has been a lot of fun. Oh, it's been a really interesting episode. I've learned a ton. Yes. Like this guest, uh, once again, we love having guests on because we, we get to learn so much. <laughs> I could talk about this for the rest of the night easily. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Listeners, how much time you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we finish the episode, there is a tradition that we have here where some of our patrons at a certain level get to ask us questions that we will answer briefly in just a couple minutes on the podcast at the end of an episode. And since you're here, we thought maybe it might be fun for you to answer a question. Why, yeah. <laughs> so this question comes from a patron of ours named Rita. All right. Who asks, are there areas where paleontology and archaeology overlap? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Um, there's lots of examples of that. So... You can go into um, things like, think about, uh, there was just a, pub a study published very, very recently where these native peoples had created a giant hut using something like 60 different individual mammoth, indivi like mammoth individuals, not bones. <laughs> wow. 60 mammoths worth of bones. They made this <laughs> huge hut. So that's all, like that's paleontology on the mammoth side, like studying the actual mm -hmm. mammoth bones and then archaeology studying the way that they were built into a structure. Um, you could also talk about paleoanthropology, looking at hominids from you know two, three million years ago. That's one of those gray areas where you're like, okay, I'm studying hominids, but are they quote unquote humans? Mm -hmm. Is it still anthropology? Is it paleontology? That's why it's called paleoanthropology. Um, and you can even go so far, you can talk about zooarchaeology, which again, it's a little fuzzy. It's that boundary between studying the animals at an archaeological site versus paleontology. And you can use the cutoff of 10,000 years if you're one of the people that defines a fossil as 10,000 years or older is a fossil, and 10,000 years younger is a subfossil. Um, 
And depending on your definition, that could also absolutely be paleontology Mm -hmm. at an archaeo site. So someone who's studying the deer or the dogs or the bison or the domestic cattle that are associated with a human site could absolutely be paleontology. The two fields also will uh, exchange practices. Yes. So like at Gray, the way the grid system we use to dig in our pits is something we kind of adopted from archaeological techniques. Absolutely. Because we have a rich enough site that we can do it. Right. Yeah. That, that, that it's worth being that meticulous, whereas a lot of paleo sites, there's no need for that. You don't have yes. the time or the energy to put into that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there are cases where you have paleontologists and archaeologists at the same site. Surely. Mm-hmm. I've not been to one, but I like... Unless you count our archaeology volunteers. Yeah, that's true. Yes. That's true. Yeah, we us have volunteering that. with the archaeologists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I don't think that's what you meant. <laughs> well, that's a very good question, Rita. Thanks for asking and for your patronage. Thanks, Laura, for answering it. Absolutely. Good question. And thanks again so much for being here with us. Of course. Thanks for having me on. This was wonderful. This has been a, This has been super fun. And this is another one of those, like... Sometimes we'll have a guest on and it's like, oh, that would be cool to have that guest on. And then other times it's finally, yes, <laughs> 84 episodes in, we finally got Laura on the podcast. Yay. <laughs> so we were very excited uh, to finally get you here. Good. Well, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Listeners, we hope that you've enjoyed this. As always, there will be pictures and links to more information in the blog post. And as usual with our guest episodes, if you're a patron, head over to Patreon. We will be putting up our after chat, which will be a little bit of extra conversation with Laura as we wind down after our recording. We release new episodes every fortnight. Our next episode is episode 85, and our longtime listeners know what that means. Bum, bum, bum. It's an extinction episode coming up soon. And with that, I think we've said all the stuff. Once again, thanks to our listeners who requested the episode. Thanks to our patrons, our new patrons and our old patrons. And one more time, huge thanks to Laura for joining us. Thanks for being here. Thanks again so much for having me. (laughs) And we'll see everybody next time. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.